Good afternoon, and thank you for joining this virtual briefing on the war in Ukraine and its global consequences. I'm Dr. Lainey Rutko, a professor at the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health and Vice Provost of Interdisciplinary Initiatives at Johns Hopkins University. Over the past 35 days, Russia's invasion of Ukraine has caused immense human suffering. Based on UN figures, over 1,100 civilians have been killed, and many more have been injured. And those figures likely undercount the true number of civilian casualties so far. Additionally, millions of people have had to flee from Ukraine to other countries, and millions more are internally displaced. The war is a multifaceted crisis, which is having and will continue to have profound repercussions in Ukraine, in Russia, across the region, and around the globe. Analyzing a crisis like this demands an interdisciplinary approach. That is why Johns Hopkins University convened today's briefing to help us consider the implications of this crisis from the perspective of geopolitical history and strategy, public health and human rights, global and cybersecurity, and the global economy. I'm grateful to my five colleagues from across the university who are joining us today. Sergei Rodchenko is the Wilson E. Schmidt Distinguished Professor at the Johns Hopkins School of Advanced International Studies, where he's affiliated with the Kissinger Center for Global Affairs. Sergei is a historian of the Cold War and of Russian and Chinese foreign policies. Leonard Rubinstein is Professor of the Practice at the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health and core faculty of the Center for Public Health and Human Rights the Center for Humanitarian Health, and the Berman Institute of Bioethics. Len is a human rights lawyer whose current work includes advancing the protection of health in armed conflict. He recently published the book, Perilous Medicine, The Struggle to Protect Healthcare from the Violence of War. Gigi Granval is a senior scholar at the Johns Hopkins Center for Health Security and an associate professor in the Department of Environmental Health and Engineering at the Bloomberg School of Public Health. Gigi is an immunologist by training, and among her areas of expertise is the assessment of weapon of mass destruction threats. Thomas Ridd is professor of strategic studies at the Johns Hopkins School of Advanced International Studies, and he is the founding director of the Alperovich Institute for Cybersecurity Studies. Thomas is an expert on information security, political warfare, and cyber threats. Ting Long Dai is Professor of Operations Management and Business Analytics at the Johns Hopkins Carey Business School. He's an expert in global supply chains, healthcare analytics, and human AI interaction. Before I turn to each of our panelists for their initial thoughts, I want to remind our audience that we'll be providing answers to your questions in real time. So please submit questions for our experts in the box that you see at the bottom of your screen. When you do so, if possible, please include your organizational affiliation. I'm now going to turn to each panelist for a brief overview of key topics, and then we'll move on to Q&A. Sergey, I'll turn to you first. Can you please speak about the historical backstory to the current conflict and offer some thoughts about the significance of this moment in history? Thank you, Lainey. Thank you for your kind introduction. And it's a true honor to uh, uh, speak to this audience alongside my colleagues at Johns Hopkins. I'm a historian, so I would start not in February 2022 or indeed in 2014. I would actually go back uh, for my remarks to um, 1991. This was the year when the Soviet Union collapsed. And for much of the world, certainly for the West, this was a moment of great triumph. Since there was a sense that that uh, that the world has changed for much better, uh, there was great euphoria and great expectations of a better age ahead. But not so for Russia. Russia found itself in deep economic 
crisis. It struggled with hyperinflation. There was a huge uh, problem with poverty across Russia. People's incomes evaporated. Uh, the high point of that was the 1998 economic crisis, uh, which I remember very well. I was at the time in Russia just to remember the sheer bewilderment that people had at that time about their, their savings simply going to nothing. Uh, there was significant drop in life expectancy across Russia at one point in the mid-1990s. Um, males' uh, average life expectancy was as low as 58 years. Um, there was crime and corruption just sprawling everywhere. It was a very unsafe place at the time. And there was a lot of political instability. Russia, which was supposed to have embarked, embarked on a road towards democratic reforms, got stuck. It just wasn't going there. In 1993, Yeltsin ordered the shooting of the existing parliament, shut it down. Um, uh, there was a, a growth of populism, which was connected to economic instability. I was thinking here of the 1993 Duma elections, where the uh, key parties that gained the most votes were the uh, far right and the far left, uh, left the so-called liberal Democrats, which were actually you know, fascists for most intents and purposes, and uh, the communists. Um, there were wars in Chechnya. Uh, that were launched first by Yeltsin and then, of course, finished by Putin. Fundamentally, Russia failed to discover a role for itself. I'm here reminded of that phrase that Dean Acheson said to have said about the UK that it, found, it lost an empire but never found a role. I think actually the UK, after decolonization, found a role for itself. It embraced uh, European integration, at least for a time. Uh, it also found itself in a partnership with the United States, special relationship with the United States. This did not happen to Russia. Russian, Russian political elite, Russian population were trying to figure out where to go in the 1990s. They were trying, they were looking for directions, they were drifting. They were drifting in, in, in just, just out there without any clear ideology, without any ideas to embrace. And I think that drift largely explains the backsliding and uh, uh, the current crisis that we have you know, with Russia's invasion of Ukraine. That failure to discover what Russia actually stands for, or perhaps actually discovery that Russia, what they wanted Russia to stand for, was uh, the imperial Russia of the 19th century. And that, I think, is a true uh, tragedy. Russia also failed to find an anchoring in the West. And I would say that this was a fault of both sides. As a Russian, I would mainly blame Russians, uh, Russians themselves. After all, uh, it was the Russians who had uh, who failed to embrace uh, democracy, who failed uh, to, uh, you know, who, who ended up with this kind of corrupt economy, etc. Uh, why should we blame the West for it? But uh, it, it's also true that Russia was outside of key European institutions and was again drifting uh, out there without any anchor. And by key European institutions, of course, I mean the European Union. Russia was not a part of that integration process and also NATO. The Russians desperately wanted to join NATO in the 1990s, but of course that was a, a false hope for them. So Russia did not find a role. Russia did not find an idea for itself. Russia did not find an anchor in Europe. And that, I think, largely explains uh, uh, the subsequent behavior of the Russian political elites under Vladimir Putin. Very quickly, in the couple of minutes that I have remaining, I will just say a few words about Ukraine. Ukraine was, of course, uh, played a crucial role in the Soviet collapse in 1991. If it weren't for Ukraine, uh, it was perhaps possible to preserve the Soviet Union in some shape or form, but it was actually Ukrainians striving for independence that helped bring the Soviet Union down. Um, that did, that, there was immediately uh, tension between Russia and Ukraine from that moment in 1991 when they parted. Uh, that tension had multiple causes. There was disagreement about Crimea, of course, which had been handed over by Nikita Khrushchev to Ukraine, but was populated mainly by ethnic Russians. And Russia still tried to play a role in the Ukrainian political process, playing on the fact that so many Russians in Eastern Ukraine, uh, so many uh, residents of Eastern Ukraine were ethnic Russians, who also perhaps the Russian political elites elites hoped could uh, look to Moscow as much as they looked to Kiev. 
so that sets us up for the situation in 2014, which was, of course, the uh, uh, the beginning of this war. It didn't happen, didn't begin in 2022, it began in 2014. Uh, there was the, uh, the 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 overthrow of uh, yeah, of a corrupt uh, president of Ukraine, Yanukovych, which was followed by the Russian takeover of Crimea and the Russian-sponsored and supported war in Donbass. I think Vladimir Putin thought that this was an unfinished project for him, and now he thought that there was an opportunity. Why did he think there was an opportunity? Well, the world had been distracted by COVID. That's one reason. Then, of course, the Biden administration rolled in, uh, hoping to focus on China primarily as its main area of interest and hoping to just stabilize Russia, which was a false expectation on their part. And of course, the debacle of Afghanistan also contributed to Putin's expectation that the United States and the West would not do anything. Plus, remember here that the 2000 uh, 14 sanctions in the aftermath of Russian uh, takeover annexation of Crimea actually proved quite weak. So that encouraged Putin to think that he'd weather another round of sanctions. And fundamentally, I think Putin thought that Ukraine uh, was already assigned to Russian sphere of influence. It was not covered by NATO uh, security guarantees. It was not covered by Article 5. So the chances of the West actually interfering with Russian operations in Ukraine, with Russia's war in Ukraine, were quite minimal in his interpretation. Therefore, he decided to uh, unleash this uh, provocative attack on Ukraine. But of course, in some ways, he badly miscalculated. But that brings us to where we are today. Thank you. And uh, back to you, Lainey. Thanks so much, Sergey. Len, I'm now going to turn to you. Can you give us your assessment of the evolving humanitarian crisis? Thank you, Lainey. It's really a privilege to join this important discussion. Uh, everyone who has seen the picture of a pregnant woman on a stretcher in front of a maternity hospital whose front has been blown off understands the brutality of this war and its terrible humanitarian con consequences. Uh, Russian forces, I should say, uh, started striking civilian areas the first day of the war. In one instance, uh, those forces hit a hospital, killed four people, and injured 10 others. And as its military offensive stalled, it picked up attacks on cities and civilians. We all have seen uh, what's happening in Mariupol, where the city is largely destroyed. There's no electricity, food, or water, and civilians cannot leave as there is no humanitarian corridor. Although the number can't be confirmed, the mayor has said that there were all, almost 5,000 deaths in the city, including some from starvation, and the number could even be higher. Other cities are being destroyed. Healthcare is under attack. Uh, the, the World Health Organization, as of today, has reported 80 three or 84 attacks, including 72 deaths. And according to the NGO Insecurity Insight, uh, most of these attacks are tied to military offensives. A third are in the Kyiv Oblast and a quarter in the Donbass region. And the attacks are extremely violent. 32 artillery strikes, six missile attacks, five rocket attacks, four airstrikes, two instances of uh, banned cluster munition use against these facilities. And as Lenny said, it's displacement of the population is extraordinary. 10 million people are displaced, uh, of whom about two thirds of them are internal and almost 4 million have fled the country. Meanwhile, UNHCR has reported that another 13 million people are stranded in place, uh, prevented from leaving where they are by Russian forces or finding it too dangerous to travel. Uh, these numbers and the image of the pregnant woman in front of the hospital only convey the most visible harms. I I'd like to share a story with a pediatrician I spoke to in the city of Melitopol, which is in southeastern Ukraine, has not gotten a lot of attention. In the first week of the war, it was contested and subject to heavy fighting and destruction and ultimately captured and occupied by Russian forces. She told me that medications for her patients haven't gotten through because despite efforts, there's no humanitarian corridor and she can't do anything for her patients. She's also terrified about seeing patients in clinics for whom she's responsible 
because she risks arrest when going about the city. She told me she is torn between her obligations to patients and her own safety. Her conversation and what it indicates bespeaks a much larger and less visible public health crisis. The humanitarian blockages are severe and are preventing medications and all kinds of food equipment needed for care get to get through, getting through. Uh, and we know that demand is very high. Trauma cases, as in every war, have increased dramatically because of injuries from explosives. And yet the capacity to address them is very slim. At the same time, because of the need to, to deal with traumatic injuries and the shortage of medication, primary and chronic care has decreased. Dialysis in many places has had to end. Treatment for hepatitis and uh, HIV have been obstructed by the lack of humanitarian corridors. We don't know what other aspects of public health have been affected. In some places, vaccinations do continue, but we don't know where they've been severely constrained. We also don't know whether there's been an increase in infectious, especially respiratory diseases, as is common in war, but it would not be a surprise to find out. The long-term prospects for the health system are even more grim if the conflict continues, because health workers who are fleeing uh, are likely not to return if the war continues. This conduct by Russia is not new. It destroyed the capital of Chechnya, Grozny, in a war 20 years ago that, surge, uh, uh, that took place shortly after the fall of the Soviet Union. It also bombed many hospitals. And of course, it joined the Assad regime in Syria in 2015. And between the two of them, they have struck hospitals 600 times since the war began. They've also used bunker buster bombs against uh, hospitals when placed in caves or underground. Finally, I think we have to note that the humanitarian catastrophe extends beyond Ukraine. The war has had cas cascading effects on food availability. Ukraine and Russia together produce 30% of the world's grain. And the World Food Program uh, also said that Ukraine produces the majority of sunflower oil. As a result, there have been dramatic price hikes around the world, uh, countries in the Middle East in particular affected. And in Yemen, the World Food Program has already had to reduce uh, rations, even as prices are skyrocketing. And as long as the war continues, uh, the prospects become even more bleak. In the near term, unless humanitarian uh, corridors open, we'll see even more massive suffering. As long as the attacks on civilian areas continue, you'll see more death and deprivation of health care. And at the end, there has to be accountability, and we can talk about that later. I'll stop there and turn it back to Lainey. Thanks, Len. Gigi. Many of our viewers will have read about or heard about concerns that Vladimir Putin might resort to the use of weapons of mass destruction, WMDs, in Ukraine. What is your assessment of this threat? Sure. Um, I'll go through each of the potential threats in turn. So first, of course, um, is the potential for uh, nuclear weapons use. Um, it is unfortunately part of Russian military doctrine that if uh, Russian conventional forces are under threat, that there is uh, written into the policy uh, the potential for um, a what they call a tactical nuclear weapon use or a, a, a small nuclear bomb uh, about the size of Hiroshima or some fraction of it. So um, this would uh, be what is termed a escalate to de-escalate strategy. So there would be the escalation of use of a nuclear weapon in order to de-escalate the potential for further conflict. 
Um, this is, of course, would be a, um, a, a very risky and dangerous um, for potential for further escalation, not de-escalation. It would break a, an 80 plus year norm against the use of nuclear weapons. And of course, it would cause a lot of human de devastation that would that would linger for quite a long time. So that is the potential for a nuclear weapons use. Um, Turning to another type of uh, weapon of mass destruction, um, biological weapons. Um, Russia does have an offensive biological weapons program in violation of international law. And so when Russia accused Ukraine of having an illegal, um, of having biological weapons, the immediate concern was that, um, that there would be, that Russia would use biological weapons in Ukraine and uh, then blame the Ukrainians for having used them, which would justify the um, escalation um, to use uh, either the same in kind biological weapons or some other um, type of, of weapon to escalate the conflict. So that was the immediate concern when they first blamed Ukraine for having a biological weapons program. But now, um, I mean, it's only days, but the hope is that um, that the it, that it is mostly a disinformation campaign, which is bad, but I mean, it's not as bad as actual uh, biological weapons use. And so the hope is that it is a disinformation campaign to, uh, to say that the Ukrainians have a, an illegal biological weapons program, which they do not, um, and, uh, and that they will just continue that, um, that this is a longstanding um, disinformation campaign that Russia has against uh, the U.S. funding of global public health um, laboratory work around the world. Um, chemical weapons are not generally considered to be weapons of mass destruction, but this is a, um, a big concern for, uh, for use by Russia and Ukraine because um, Russia has supported the use of chemical weapons in Syria uh, before now, and they have um, also uh, engaged in a lot of um, chemical weapons development that has led to um, assassination attempts and success. Um, and even just uh, day before yesterday, reports there were reports that uh, the negotiating team from Ukraine um, was affected by some chemical agent, some poison. It's unclear if we will ever know exactly what, what went on there, but that caused uh, skin effects and uh, loss of vision. So um, it does make it very hard to negotiate the end of a subtle, at the end of, uh, of the war if the negotiating team can't um, be guaranteed their safety. So in addition to those WMD considerations, um, just like Len said, we, uh, you know, you can have the spread of disease can be a concern, even if it's not deliberate. And, um, and you know, we still, we still have a pandemic, COVID still is a problem. And uh, there is a, uh, Ukraine did, did not have a good vaccination rate prior to the invasion, about 35%. So this is something that is a, going to be a concern for people who are sheltering and people who um, are leaving Ukraine for other countries. There was a polio um, case, a vaccine-connected uh, case of, uh, of polio in October. There was supposed to be a vac mass vaccination campaign that was supposed to be underway now, which is obviously uh, canceled as a result. So these are other public health threats that are, um, that are being left because of uh, the war. There's also the spread of disinformation, um, you know, equating biological laboratories doing biological uh, laboratory things and good science and public health work, equating that with nefarious activity is, um, is, is not good at all. And we're going to be living with, with that for years to come. And we're already seeing this um, in right-wing conservative uh, circles in the US. So um, this is a, a big problem. And now I'm going to pass it back to Lainey. Thank you very much. Thanks, Gigi. Thomas, I'll now turn to you. Russia is a country known to have significant cyber capabilities. Can you give us an update on what's been happening in Ukraine in the cyber realm and also how these threats might impact other democracies? Yeah, thank you for having me on. Um, cyber conflict, cyber war has been uh, expected at the big at the start of any major 
armed confrontation now for more than two decades. Um, and uh, we now have one of the most uh, high tech, most intense, most brutal confrontations in a very long time in uh, living memory and beyond in Europe. So a lot of people expected the cyber uh, confrontation to start at, at the beginning, if not before the conflict. And um, it did actually happen, but it looked very different from what a lot of people expected. It was not the high tech, uh, you know, messing with air control systems, lights going out, blackout causing cyber attack that a lot of, I think, uh, observers naively expected. But instead, what we're seeing is more insidious, more low profile operations of a different type and of a different kind. Uh, operations that are mostly designed to be covert or semi-covert, really sabotage is what we're talking about, and really also very high profile intelligence collection. So let me ad address those in turn. What types of sabotage have, have we seen? The most visible, I think, type of cyber operation, digital sabotage that we've seen are are forms of activism. I think this is what a lot of people see in the news, forms of activism of anonymous uh, activists uh, trying to hack various Russian targets. And of course, um, we've seen a number of attacks also uh, targeting Ukrainian infrastructure. But in some ways, these um, this, these activists, uh, you know, bringing down websites, smearing websites, defacing websites, um, that is more of a distraction than uh, than of actual real operational significance. So what's what else is there? If we take things up a notch into the more sophisticated, slightly more sophisticated uh, realm of computer network operations, done most likely by professionals, then what we see here are a range of so-called wiping attacks. These are computer network attacks designed to wipe software, to, to delete software on target systems to bring down companies, for example, or sometimes trains, and, um, train stations mostly that display a public facing part of, of, of those systems. But these wiping attacks, uh, we've seen a good number of them beginning in January. So around six are publicly known now each targeting a small number of entities, both in the private sector and in government. But even those are not really that significant so far, it appears. We're still waiting for more information. So one level up, what we've seen is a more interesting, perhaps, a command and control attack against a satellite services provider in Ukraine. So the Ukrainian armed forces, the Ukrainian military, Ukrainian intelligence and the Ukrainian government is relying on satellite broadband services um, by uh, provided by an American company called Viasat, uh, used, using a European satellite called KASAT to provide these services. Um, we've seen an attack that bricked a very brick, meaning disabled a very large number of their modems. And just this morning, Viasat has provided an explanation, and it appears that indeed we're looking at a command and control uh, attack against the Ukrainian. Uh, platforms that rely on sat satellite communication. For example, that could be drones, could be aircraft, could be ground forces. We don't know specifically what's affected. And that is the key point. We don't know the details. We will only find out, in some cases, weeks, months, or years later, what happened. These operations are semi-covert, sometimes completely covert. Which brings me to perhaps the biggest uh, story that I think um, we should touch on. And it's not what most people expect when they hear cyber operations. But just two days ago, the Ukrainian military intelligence service, GUR, um, revealed the names of 620 FSB officers, including names, passport numbers, and some, some cases, phone numbers, publicly on their website. You've seen another leak like that uh, in, on Pravda, Ukraine, that revealed as many as 100,000 uh, members of the Ukrainian armed forces, including with their home addresses, names, and mobile phone numbers. These leak operations are significant because they could be ultimately the result of digital intelligence collection, in other words, of cyber operations. And I will point out finally, just a couple of minutes ago, as we were speaking, there's a breaking news story in the New York Times with yet another very high-profile American 
intelligence revelation in this case about frictions between the Soviet, uh, uh, sorry, between the Russian Ministry of Defense and uh, the president, Vladimir Putin. We've seen probably, I can't remember any war, any major war where we've seen so much real time intelligence reporting on, uh, on one adversary, in this case, obviously, Russia. And what we're looking at here is two things at the same time, an extraordinary intelligence success on the part of the Five Eyes and especially the United States in penetrating Russian targets, most likely through some form of computer network operation or signals intelligence. Certainly also human intelligence, but, but I'm, I'm thinking more likely technical. And the second thing that we're seeing, which is truly spectacular, is a failure of Russian counterintelligence to stop this collection because it's ongoing and in fact, getting more detailed. So I think though that story of the intelligence cat and mouse game that's happening in the shadows and revealing so much of this war in real time on tactical levels, on operational levels, and on strategic levels like the story just now is showing, that is the real story. That's where, the, where cyber operations, and really let's be more uh, appropriate where modern intelligence collection techniques make the biggest difference. I'll stop here and uh, thank you, Lainey. Thanks, Thomas. And finally, Ting Long, I'd like to ask you to speak about some of the global economic consequences of this conflict, especially implications for global supply chains and economic globalization. Sure. <clears throat> thank you, Lainey. Uh, as a researcher in global supply chains, I believe the war signals the end of global supply chains. Um, that may sound a very bold statement. Uh, so let me start by defining the term supply chain. A supply chain is a network of resources, money, information, and most importantly, people that companies rely on to get products or services to consumers. So a supply chain is fundamentally a social network. In case it's not, it is not obvious, the global supply chains we are talking about today haven't always existed. They were built by Western companies after the fall of the Berlin Wall more than 30 years ago. These supply chains have operated on two key assumptions. First, there's a separation of geopolitics and business. Second, supply chain participants believe that rational decision making will eventually prevail. Now, obviously, global supply chains were already in a bad shape due to the, the still ongoing COVID-19 pandemic. As consumers, each of us has seen significant shortages, shipping delays, and price inflation over the past two years. The war in Ukraine and the sanctions against Russia have put an even more short-term pressure on food, energy, and semiconductor supply chains and global logistics. But beyond these short-term impacts, I think the war in Ukraine has the potential to significantly shape global supply chains in fundamental ways that the COVID-19 pandemic never did. Now to start with, Russia accounts for less than 2% of global GDP and that uh, contribution is expected to shrink this year. And Ukraine accounts for only 0.14%. So as a result, even in a few critical uh, sectors and other than these sectors such as the food, energy, semiconductors, as I mentioned earlier, overall the war has minimal direct effects on global supply chains. But the indirect effects is actually quite significant. And if we talk, think about the war, uh, in, its impacts on global logistics and trade. And the effect that can be bigger than the COVID-19. For example, to think about the closure of 36 nations airspace to Russian aircraft. And that closure uh, was actually uh, announced by EU members, United States and Canada and also other countries. And then Russia obviously reacted with similar restrictions. As a result of such restrictions, so products shipped by air freight from China to Europe or to the Eastern uh, United States, we need to reroute it or transfer it using slower or more expensive means of transportation. Now, the other uh, important logistic impact is about the China-Europe rail uh, route. And some of you may have heard, heard about it. 
and because this uh, this railway connects China and Europe through Russia, and had a major surge back in 2021 because of major global supply chain disruptions. Now this rail freight now is seeing uh, a surge in cancellations because of uh, uh, you know all the sanctions from Europe and from the United States. And also that this war has made impact on global trade with hundreds of tankers and bug uh, uh, carriers delayed at the ports due to restrictions placed on Russian connected ships. It has also caused significant travel and transportation restrictions being put on Russia and the Belarus in a remarkably quick and comprehensive way connected by multiple countries. And the interruption of global logistics and trade may further damage China's Belt and Road Initiative. So for those who are not familiar, this Belt and Road Initiative is a um, trillion dollar initiative aimed at changing global commerce and reinforcing the dominance of a China-centric global supply chain, especially in Europe and Asia because Russia and Ukraine both are important connections in this initiative, the size and scope of the initiative will certainly need to be uh, reduced. Now, let me move to um, discuss long-term effects. As I mentioned at the very beginning, there are two important assumptions that today's global supply chains depend on. Number one, we have this sort of ambiguity tolerance which means there's a separation of geopolitics and business. So companies and governments, for the most part, ignore old enemy lines for the sake of efficiency and higher profits. And the second assumption is the dominance of economic calculations over geopolitics. So not only one can separate um, this business from geopolitics, but our business can also uh, be, uh, become a positive force to improve peace and stability. So, uh, and, and then, you know, following that line, the reason is essentially is because that even uh, dictators, eventually they focus on, uh, uh, you know, economic calculations, eventually uh, the decision will tend to be optional, uh, will tend to be optimal and rational. Now, importantly, in business schools across the world, including Johns Hopkins, we teach supply chains without even touching upon geopolitics. The reason we don't teach geopolitics is because we assume it's irrelevant. Our folks has been to coordinate the supply chains, assuming that each supply chain participant is rational and chooses actions to maximize their economic surplus. Now, obviously, these assumptions have been destroyed by Russia's action uh, in Ukraine. And as a result, we are expected to see a new kind of iron curtain, which could emerge with Russia and its allies on one side and the West on the other side. It's no longer possible to avoid picking sides and the consequences of this reconfiguration of global supply chains in terms of more poverty, loss of innovation and job opportunities are something we will all have to pay for in the future decades. And furthermore, as shareholders and regulators place a great focus on environmental, social, and governance problems, also known as ESG, how a company performs in each area can have an impact in the day-to-day -day operations and the cost of capital. So related to this war, one reason firms have over-complied with the sanctions is really an effort to be more socially responsible. It is also encouraging them to take more proactive measures to minimize geopolitical risks, which may include withdrawing from an entire economy and proactively. So to summarize, Russia's war against Ukraine is still ongoing and there are still many unknowns. But one thing is pretty sure is that this war will fundamentally reshape global supply chains. And the global supply chains we have known for the past 30 years will no longer exist. Thank you. Thanks so much, Tim Long. I'm now going to turn to questions that have come in from viewers, questions that have come in in advance of the briefing, as well as those that have been submitted live. And I do want to thank everyone who's submitting questions. I am keeping an eye, and I do see your questions continuing to come in. Um, and please do continue to submit them over the next 20 minutes or so. So, Sergey, I'm going to start with 
with you. And this is a question that's an amalgam of several that, it, that have come in. So the general theme is, what if any are the possible compromises by both sides that could potentially end this conflict? Uh, so thank you for that. Uh, the, the peace talks are ongoing, of course. We've had uh, a number of rounds already. Uh, the war aims for Putin to begin with were to overthrow Ukraine's government to replace the president. That's as clear as that. Uh, however, because of Russia's poor performance, now the, those war aims have been dialed back somewhat. And it seems that uh, Russia is willing to settle for lesser gains, which include, uh, from what we can now say by their recent claims, uh, the promise that Ukraine will not join NATO, that it will not allow military bases to be located on Ukraine's soil, that it will not pursue nuclear weapons and other WMD development and uh, uh, I think another uh, a potential additional Russian uh, point that they want to achieve is recognition of Donbass uh, and uh, Crimea as you know, independent, or in Crimea's case, Russian territory. Now, all of those claims are potentially unacceptable to the Ukrainians, although they may be willing to make some compromise on issues like Ukraine's membership in uh, NATO or non-membership in NATO. So at the moment, the two sides are still negotiating. Uh, it is clear that uh, the Russians have stepped back from some of their extreme demands, including so-called denazification of Ukraine. Mm -hmm. Uh, but it is not clear at all that given Ukraine's uh, relatively uh, good performance on the battlefield, that Ukraine is going to accept the list of Russian demands that could potentially see a uh, reduction, a further reduction of, of Ukraine's uh, territory. Thanks, Sergei. Len, question for you. What so far has this conflict taught us about what can be done to ensure more resilient public health infrastructure during a conflict? Oh, well, that's a really difficult uh, question. I think uh, there has been a lot of effort to provide immediate training uh, to uh, physicians and surgeons in dealing with the complex injuries, which they're not used to seeing, uh, to get surgical supplies in and to provide them with a lot of support. And I think the international community has been very good in a way it was not in Syria and many other conflicts in expressing solidarity. Uh, but the main thing is to get uh, humanitarian corridors open, because in the absence of that, it's very hard to talk about resilience. Uh, these uh, health facilities under, are under such enormous strain and without medications, uh, it's very difficult to expect any kind of resilience. Thanks, Len. Gigi, question for you. If Russia were to use a chemical or a biological weapon, what is the likely response from the United States or other nations? Um, there would definitely be, um, I, I don't know what the what has been decided to be the response and, and what the uh, would probably depend on what was used in the scale of, of use. Um, I, the, the White House is uh, being very careful to not um, to not telegraph what they what they would do, except that it would be there would be a response. Um, there has not been a, uh, a biological weapon used um, since World War II. Um, uh, so it would be definitely a, you know, serious degradation of that norm and it could be, depending on what was used, it could be a problem that extends far beyond uh, Ukraine's borders. So, um, uh, uh, let's hope that e even though it's a terrible situation as, uh, as is that it stays at the level of a disinformation campaign. Thanks, Gigi. And Thomas, I'm going to ask you a question that, um, actually follows up nicely from where Gigi just ended, which is. What are the possible ways to counter the type of disinformation that we now see coming out related to this conflict? It's a very tough question, I think, because really what's happening is that um, ultimately multiple different parties, not just Russia, um, is 
using tricks out of the old active measures playbook, not necessarily with by forging information and or documents or lying, but by spinning, you know, information in certain ways and maybe framing sometimes in a misleading way. The only solution here is the old fashioned, cautious fact checking and, you know, Keep in mind, active measures, the old intelligence trade of art here, term of art, is activating emotional reactions. So whenever you respond emotionally to a message, it's probably designed so that people respond emotionally. And that, of course, means be very careful and check your facts. Thanks, Thomas. Ting Long, I want to shift focus for a, a moment to China and where China will potentially end up in the global economy um, based on the evolution of global supply chains that you mentioned? Oh, uh, that's complicated. Like uh, I mentioned uh, earlier, you know, today's global supply chain, for the most part, I would say that, you know, when people talk about global supply chains, essentially it means China, right? So that's obvious. And uh, our project will continue to depend on China for a long time, uh, but it's almost certain uh, to be certain that this war will become a catalyst for the United States and also European countries to reduce dependence on China for critical supplies, especially think about medical supplies, um, the prescription drugs, uh, electric batteries, and the semiconductor manufacturing materials. I think people will think twice, and in fact, it's already happening, and certain regions of China will already see limitations. And this is already become part of the ESG effort. So what I'm, the point I'm trying to make here is that uh, China will continue to be important part of global supply chains, but it's, we're not going to accept um, Chinese-made products without any screening. That's not going to happen. Uh, in fact, it's going to be as a lot of we're we going to see a lot of restrictions and a lot of considerations and we can potentially see industry policies in response to this war and so that's what i mean in terms of iron reporting i do not really mean that there will be no trade between china and the united states at all what i mean is that there will be selection will be restrictions and then there will be front and central in this global trade see thank you Sergey, question for you. Why do you think the world has reacted differently to the current conflict than what we saw during the invasion and annexation of Crimea? Because it seems that it just went a step too far. Uh, during the annexation of, uh, of, of Crimea, it, it, it was so quick. Uh, uh, obviously, you know, it was it, 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 the world was outraged, but it was done very efficiently. And it seemed there were lots of Russians there who were very supportive of that. And of course, Ukraine protested, but I think many in Europe were willing to uh, uh, overlook this. Not, not necessarily overlook, but not to pay too much attention to it. Um, but what we happened, what happened in, in recent weeks was in blatant, absolutely blatant buildup of massive forces, invasion of Ukraine uh, on, on a much greater scale than what we saw in uh, two, 2014. And I think there's this general uh, frustration in Europe and in the West with Putin. I mean, this he's obviously unleashed repressions at home. He has poisoned Navalny. He has uh, resorted to uh, chemical weapons and in, in, you know, going after his opponents in the West. Uh, he's uh, done all sorts of terrible things in places like Syria, for example. So I think there's this kind of a build up of frustration to a point of uh, uh, great an anger. So that was triggered when he invaded Ukraine and he faced out, he faced such resistance by Ukraine, of course, but also uh, such anger across Europe that really brought Europe together in a way that he never anticipated. I mean, NATO today has greater solidarity than Putin uh, could have ever imagined, uh, thanks to his own actions. Thanks, Sergey. Gigi, question for you. If a chemical or biological attack is conducted, what options do Ukrainians have to stay safe? Um, it really depends on uh, what uh, what it is um, and what the what the public health response, what the health response would would be. 
um, you know, for example, some biological weapons that have been uh, weaponized that Russia has uh, included in their biological weapons program are contagious and some are not, you know, so uh, there's different uh, vaccines or, or antidotes, depending on what we're talking about. So it really depends. Um, but attribution is another uh, consideration as well. Um, there are international organizations that would be involved in trying to document this to, um, to you know, to demonstrate that this was uh, used and, and who did it. Thanks, Gigi. Thomas, question for you. Is it true that NATO allies have not suffered major Russian cyber attacks? So far, we have um, seen collateral impacts from the satellite um, Viasat uh, attack that I uh, briefly mentioned. Um, tens of thousands of satellite modems in Germany, for example, in a wind park, uh, thousands of uh, wind turbines went offline as a result of this attack. But these were collateral effects. Of course, President Biden has um, warned prominently of impending Russian um, operations and indicted uh, in, a, in, a, in a fairly aggressive fashion Russian operators just recently in that context, but we haven't seen uh, actual attacks. Uh, on the COVID question, though, if I may, um, on the on the there's an interesting COVID link. This is a, another quick comment only. But I recently engaged with a school in Kiev and gave a talk there, and uh, I was just so fascinated by the fact that. The, the experience of living through lockdown and COVID over the past two years, because people are now so used to operating remotely in companies and pu pu in the pu public sector especially, has probably made it easier for Ukrainians to be resilient in the face of this war. It's just a fascinating dynamic there. Thanks, Thomas. Len, question for, for you. Many mm -hmm. folks want to um, do something that they feel can um, can help refugees who are leaving Ukraine or who are internally displaced. What do you see as the most effective ways to be involved? We haven't really talked about the enormous number of refugees uh, in this crisis and the incredible generosity of, of countries with relatively small population to take huge numbers of refugees. Uh, it's a strange thing to say, but I think the thing that could be most useful now is money. Uh, the, the needs are so enormous. Uh, Europe and the U.S. The government are going to step up and provide a lot of services or funding for services. Uh, but the organizations need more. Uh, there are so many different kinds of needs, uh, immediate needs, uh, potential resettlement needs, uh, psychological support support for the kids who have been so hurt by this war. And I think we just have to depend on organizations with knowledge of how to address uh, refugee needs. And, and so supporting them uh, would be the best, the best strategy. Of course, the, and even more important than that is ending the war. Because I think most of the refugees would want to go back. They haven't been very, refugees very long and uh, they would probably prefer to go back to their country than live the difficult life of a refugee. Thanks, Len. Sergey, question for you. From where we sit now, what do you see as the likely or potential political evolution of Russia? The um, situation is grim in Russia. Uh, coincidental with this war, but actually preceding this war. Uh, Russia has been backsliding uh, towards authoritarianism, greater and greater state control. But with the war, new draconian laws have been passed that make it punishable by up, by up to 15 years in prison to criticize this war, if any Russians dare to. Uh, that doesn't mean that everybody will go to prison for 15 years, but, you know, the legal basis is being established for a repressive state. I mean, it already exists. And yes, the Russian legal system is very arbitrary and most people will just get off uh, uh, with, uh, with minor fines. Uh, nevertheless, uh, we have people already serving uh, years and years, like Alexei Navalny, who's just been resentenced again for another a long uh, prison term. And there is the spirit, there's this 
fear that is creeping into the Russian political discourse. People are afraid to speak out. Um, many people have left Russia since the war began. Uh, many are now camping out in places like Istanbul and elsewhere out of reach of, of uh, Russian authorities, primarily the educated, you know, people who can make a career, make some something with their futures in the West. Uh, while those who remain find that their space for articulation of you know basic freedoms is further and further constrained. Now that being said, you know it's very sadly actually a large percentage, but it's very difficult to say just how many people in Russia support this war because they uh, succumb to the state propaganda. They, they watch the TV, they hear what's being said on Russian you know uh, state media, and they buy into this narrative, and that is also a phenomenon. Yeah, so I, I, you you know it's not. Like like uh, it's not like it's just Putin that has gone, gone crazy and everybody in Russia is, is, is free and democratic. It's just not the case. Uh, so in general, I think Russia has become a much nastier place to be, uh, a much more disconnected from the world, a much sadder place, a much darker place. And if you mm -hmm. ask me just a few years ago, you know, is Putin another Stalin? I would say as a historian, of course not, because look, Stalin was an absolutely horrible dictator that slaughtered hundreds of thousands of people. Um, and if you ask me today, we'll still say, yes, of course not. Putin is not another Stalin. But unfortunately, what we see in place is the legal system for repressions that is unlike anything that Russia has seen since the dark days of the Soviet Union. Thanks, Sergey. And on that sobering note, I'm going to wrap up this briefing. So I'd like to thank Sergey Radchenko, Len Rubinstein, Gigi Granval, Thomas Ridd, and Ting Long Dai for joining me. And I'd also like to give a big thank you to everyone who attended and especially to those who submitted questions for our experts to answer. A recording of this event will be made available on this website. Today's panelists, together with other faculty from across Johns Hopkins University, will continue to analyze the wide ranging consequences of the war in Ukraine. I'm going to close by mentioning another event that may be of interest to many of our viewers. At noon Eastern time on Wednesday, April 13th, the Bloomberg School's Center for Public Health and Human Rights will be hosting an event co-sponsored by the school's Center for Humanitarian Health, examining violence against healthcare workers in Ukraine and other ongoing conflicts. Len will be one of the expert panelists at that event. To learn more about it and to register, please visit public health dot jhu dot edu slash events. Once again, thank you for joining today's briefing.